Okay, so today and Thursday, we'll look a little bit, a little bit different than we've been doing. Um, we'll go through a lot more papers. This allows me to kind of mention a lot more things that are kind of relevant to kind of finishing up your projects, which just as a reminder, I did change kind of the due date on that um, to be the end of the day Sunday, so the 25th. We have that fourth homework, which is due tomorrow at the end of the day, because of my mistake, I meant for it to be today, but because I said it originally for Wednesday, you have to do that to the other day tomorrow to turn that in. After class day, I'll post a fifth homework. I kind of mentioned um, this is should be viewed as like a replacement homework. So that if there was one homework you didn't do well on, your, your grade in the fifth one would replace it. So basically, I'm going to drop your lowest score. So if you're happy with your, you know, you feel pretty confident on homework four, and I'll try to get those graded as quick as possible at the end of this week um, to give you an idea about kind of where you're sitting with the first four assignments, but having that fifth one kind of be optional, um, whereas I'll, I'll drop the lowest. Okay. So I'll get that posted um, after class today. Other than that, are there any questions kind of for me before we jump into things here? Okay. And today might be a little bit short of a class. Um, like I said, we're going to start, you know, this week and next week, really kind of hammering um, just some going through more papers, talking about regression, how we think, you know, how we can analyze or, you know, look at the analysis. And then we'll probably towards the end of next week start to do a little bit of review. So I'll be getting a, a practice exam up there uh, probably sometime tomorrow. Uh, that you'll be able to start taking a look at. So let's jump into it. So I try to kind of save some of these, these findings, uh, things that we've talked about. We can think about the principles involved, but kind of grouping them together. So the first thing that we're going to kind of look at is, is gambling in sports. So, you know, one of the main, you know, we look at just, I think this was 2016 data. I mean, you can see that like there's a, a ton of kind of gambling going on across countries, across the world. Um, and a lot of this is potentially sports betting, right? So these kind of blue, you know, light blue bars, those all represent potentially sports betting. It's hard to get a real accurate uh, number on this because we can look at legal sports gambling, we can look at kind of just general sports gambling, in, in, you know, that we, you know, on the black market or things like that as well. So, you know, we kind of take a step back and think about gambling in sports. Right. All leagues have rules that, you know, the, the people involved, the players, the coaches, they can't bet on the sport, right? So there's this huge scale in 1919 where the World Series is kind of was thrown because of, of gamblers. And so, you know, these leagues really want to try to make sure, right, they, you know, ban Pete Rose from the Hall of Fame for, for illegally kind of gambling on, on games that he was involved in, um, allegedly. So, you know, they don't want gambling to kind of play a role in the outcome of the, of the events, right? We kind of had a, a more recent one. We have referees, right? Anytime we try to find these, we try to kind of get rid of this. Right? So what's the, the kind of magnitude of the amount, you know, the amount of money involved in sports gambling? So I tried to, you know, play around, kind of get some of the newest kind of uh, data that's out there. So currently 22 states have some form of legalized gambling. Like it looks a little bit different across different states. Sometimes it's only in like fantasy sports as opposed to betting on the actual games, but this has become a, a, a growing trend where states have been legalizing sports gambling. So it's difficult to get a really good estimate, um, but estimates like kind of prior to this, this new kind of uh, wave of legalized sports gambling still had the range at somewhere between 80 and $380 billion. Like it's like I said, it's hard to really get an estimate. I'm not sure you know, exactly how the researchers arrived at this, but this was kind of their, their range based off of, uh, you know, different measures of, act, of gambling activity or illegal gambling activity. Interestingly, though, we can start to look at legal sports gambling and see that the magnitude is still astronomical, right? So uh, last year, and I say last year, I believe this was not 2021, this was the two, uh, 2020 Super Bowl. There was an estimated $4.7 billion just gambling on the, on the Super Bowl. Um, I found some data, and since June 2018, just in the states that have legalized sports gambling, the legal sports betting has been $48 billion over that approximately, what, two and a half, kind of two and a half year timetable. Now this, the reason why, you know, it's $48 billion, well, this says every year it's, you know, between 80 and 380. Well, remember, this is just illegal sports gambling, right? So this is trying to capture all the illegal sports gambling that's going on as well. But 
pretty large amount of money, right? If we try to break this down, you know, by year, we're talking at, you know, approximately, you know, 15, what, 18, 19 million or something a year um, over two and a half years. So, you know, pretty large amount of money. So really, what, what is this player like? What are the most interesting things we can investigate here? Right? We can look at gambling behaviors and I, we'll look at a paper of that in a second. But we're also probably thinking about, well, maybe this new kind of sports gambling has driven up the demand curves for whatever sports people are gambling on, right? Because if I don't care, let's say I took a non-sports fan, they don't care about football at all, then start putting money on football games. They now have a more of an incentive to watch the game. It's going to provide more utility, right? They're, they're kind of worried about the outcome a little bit more. And so it really allows there to be potentially an increase in demand. Another way it could increase demand if we think about, um, whenever we think about sports gambling, they often set what they call setting like betting lines. So this tells you how many points a team is favored to win by, right? So what they're trying to do when they set these betting lines is they're always trying to set them to be a 50-50 bet. Like it should be a 50% chance that the team wins by seven or more points, 50% chance that they, you know, either win by seven or less or they lose, right? Kind of that betting line is kind of saying, you know, here's our cutoff, right? 50% chance that they win by more than this, 50% chance they win by less than this or lose. Um, so what this essentially does is it could also create a different demand curve in the sense that competitive balance may not play as large of a role now. You think about why, well, if I can set a betting line and people are now interested in watching this game because of the betting line and not just the win loss, well, now I've created a more uncertain outcome. I can guarantee that every game played, if the person watching it is watching because of the betting line, the outcome's 50-50. This is as, as good a competitive balance as I can get, right? If, I, if I'm not just kind of uh, locked into kind of the win-loss being the, the measure of, of competitive balance. So for a lot of reasons, we might think demand curves increase. Um, you know, if we go back, oh, actually, I have these out of order. I might go, I might talk about the first one here. Yeah, I'll jump. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. So with this idea of the demand curve increasing, right? So we've got a lot of players of fantasy sports, right? This isn't quite betting, right? But it is kind of, could, some of this could be, could have some money involved. Um, you kind of see people are willing to spend money on it. So the average person kind of spends, what, $184 per year, potentially on, on, on fan. Now, obviously, some people are going to be, you know, pulling that mean up and some people aren't going to spend near as much, but that was kind of the average. Um, in 2015, so DraftKings and FanDuel put out some of their data. They had 2.6 billion just in entry fees. Um, so this is, this is pretty wild. Um, notice here, they only paid out over a billion dollars. So they're making, they're making pretty good money. So one thing we might think about is, right, the utility that's derived, right, from playing fantasy sports or fantasy football, if we think about it in this case, to potentially increase the utility of consuming that sporting event, whether or not that's on TV, in person, maybe, um, you know, even a apparel or something. So we're going to see these huge demand curve increases, right? So if we see these huge demand curve increases, if we were to look at fantasy sports, sports participation, we should expect it to be positively correlated with things like ticket prices, TV viewership, right? Revenue, you know, ticket revenue. And so the question then becomes, is a greater number of fantasy sports participants increase the attendance of that sport. So, you know, we don't have a measure here in this paper we're going to look at of TV viewership or, or necessarily ticket prices, but we do have a measure of attendance, right? And if people are more interested, the demand curve has risen, you know, obviously the teams that are at capacity already, we're not going to see any movement, but for all those teams that weren't, we could potentially see an increase in the quantity of tickets they sell or the attendance at their games. So um, actually, I don't know if any of you have had him, uh, but Professor Nesbitt, who's in the you know, College of Business, had an old paper where they're looking at NFL attendance. They also tried to look at Major League Baseball and NFL television views um, and see if there's any correlation, right, or if we can predict these things looking at fantasy sports participation. So perhaps the size of the effect is understated once we actually get into the paper, um, because the Right, we have these capacity constraints. And if we're using NFL attendance data, there's not as much movement 
or sorry, room for movement for a lot of these teams because they're already selling at capacity. So what they do is they went out and they grabbed, what, eight, nine years of data, and they had this ESPN sports poll that uh, was looking at fantasy sports participation. So it was a, kind of this big survey, and it asked people things like, are you an avid fan of this sport, right? Um, do you play, you know, if you're an avid fan of Major League Baseball, do you play fantasy baseball? Or if you're an avid fan of football, do you play fantasy football, right? Those are two of the things they collected. They collected a bunch of demographics on the individual, so they make sure, like, they can control for age and things like that. Um, and then they – I forget what H and F. We'll pull the paper open here in a second. But they had some additional control variables here as well. Um, and then they say – Okay, we're going to use the dependent variable of attendance. And if we see that this fantasy kind of coefficient is positive, that's telling us that you know, if somebody plays fantasy baseball, we would expect to see it be more likely that they attend a game in a season. So the attendance was not kind of like the attendance that we saw in the stadium. The attendance was at the individual level, which is if the person played fantasy, you know, baseball, it's a one if they attended any baseball game that year, zero if they didn't. Okay. So if we looked at these results where our Y variables, whether or not they attended. So they did some in, like some tricky kind of statistical stuff, but really we can kind of just focus on uh, these coefficients here. All right, they do a two-stage probe, it, which is a slightly different way. Uh, we'll, we'll kind of ignore those columns because we're really, anything in this class, I'm just kind of keeping at kind of a simple linear regression or multiple linear regression. So, okay, so those H and F controls, those were like what the home teams, I think, and what the away teams win percentage was, the, you know, whether or not they made the World Series that year, all these different measures of kind of quality. Oh, sorry, not the away team, the, the home team and then their favorite teams kind of win-loss percentage. They were able to get some pricing data, so they controlled for ticket prices. So basically, you know, think about the thought experiment here, and you get this regression result, is holding everything else constant. So if we had two people, both were considered avid fans of Major League Baseball, both the same age, both were either a child or not a child, both were male or not male, all the way down, right? Hold all these things constant. But one of them played fantasy baseball and one of them didn't. The expected increase in the likelihood of that person who plays fantasy baseball attends a game was about 0.4. And that's a pretty sizable increase when we're talking about probabilities, right? Probabilities are between zero and one. So, you know, a 0.4 increase is a pretty large increase in the probability that you would attend a game. And they kind of set this up a little weird here. So they also gave you not the coefficients, but also the standard errors and then put the stars there. So basically this effect was very significant, right? Three stars means it's significant at the 99% level. And that kind of reminds us of it down here. And I say 99% confidence level or the 1% significance level. Now, one of the reasons why they could get kind of a pretty high, um, you know, they have a lot of significance here is they had a pretty high sample size. I think if we actually take a look, the paper pulled up here, so fantasy, major league baseball. And they did this for the NFL as well. So I think I might have initially said it was for the NFL. They have two papers where they basically just do the same thing, one for major league baseball, one for the NFL. It's really from the same survey. So we'll go down here. Oh, where's their number of observations? I should have one of these tables. Oh, maybe they don't have it. Oh, here we go. So it looks like around looks 12,000, 13,000 observations. So a pretty large data set here was able to give them some pretty significant effects, right? A lot of, see a lot of stars here. Okay, so they then did, um, Kind of this idea, and yeah, don't, I won't like put something like this on the exam, but I think it's just worth, it's interesting to point it out. They then said, okay, well, maybe the impacts of playing fantasy baseball are different for people who already were avid fans versus those who weren't, right? So they kind of tried to look at the combination, like how likely are you to attend a game if you're this different combination of things? So for those who don't play fantasy um, baseball, and they're not avid fans of Major League Baseball, there's about a 42% chance they attend a game. While if they are an avid fan, there's about a 70% chance. So you can kind of think about, well, what was the impact there of being an avid fan? Well, if I don't play fantasy 
baseball, the impact of being an avid fan was about 28% increase. And then similarly for those who do play fantasy baseball, if they're an avid fan, there was an 83% chance they attended the game that year, 95% chance, sorry, and they weren't an avid fan, there was an 83% chance. If they did play fantasy baseball and were an avid fan, there was about a 95% chance they attended the game. So only an increase of about 12% there from being an avid fan. You could then do kind of a similar idea down here, looking at what the marginal effect of playing fantasy baseball was, and you kind of see the real, what's driving this effect is for non-avid fans, going from not playing to playing fantasy baseball, increase your likelihood of attending a game by 40%. Well, as if you were an avid fan, playing fantasy baseball only increased it by about 24, which is still a large you know, change, but not quite as large as for those non-avid fans. So the idea here is that it's really kind of bringing in maybe some additional new fans to the sport, but they're really only a fan because they're playing you know, fantasy baseball or fantasy football and uh, have this added utility now of watching the games. So it's pretty interesting to kind of think about um, how gambling could potentially impact the revenues or kind of impact uh, team attendance. We'll also then go back to thinking more about betting lines, okay? So I said these betting, you know, these betting lines are supposed to be set as a 50-50 bet. It's a 50% chance that they, you know, score over that or, or a 50% chance that they score below it. So the efficient market hypothesis, if we kind of, Go back, maybe do a little bit of a, a refresher on some finance stuff. You might have heard of this in a finance course. But basically, prices of traded assets should reflect all publicly available information, right? So all, you know, when they're setting these betting lines, right, they really act as prices, right? Because if I'm saying that the betting line is zero, what I'm saying is that it's equally as likely for the team to either win or lose, right? Is it, you know, I, I don't really know. But... If I say that the betting line is 10, that they'll win by at least 10 points or more, well, I've made that a more risky kind of gamble, right? And so you kind of think about it as the your price that I would need you, you know, to be willing to, or, or the price that, the payoff I would be willing, or I would need to get to be willing to put a bet on a really extreme betting line, you would need to be willing to pay me more, right? And that's because when we set these lines, I know they're 50-50 bets and they should incorporate all available information. I could go out and gather information. It just so happens that a company is the one that's gathered it here. So anytime a betting line is set, it should be um, that there's no way if I kind of bet on, you know, a thousand different games, there's no way I should be able to get above market returns because any information I have it's available to everybody else. And so if it's available to everybody else, it's available to those companies. So they're gonna just change the betting lines, right? Up or down to make sure that it's always a 50-50 bet. So if I continually bet on these betting lines, unless I know something that the people setting those betting lines don't know, my expected payoff in the long run will always be zero. Now that doesn't mean that, you know, for any one person, they, they get lucky, right? It's just that the average expected payoff is gonna be zero. In fact, you could say it's actually not going to be zero because it's this isn't a truly uh, like um, this isn't a true um, kind of like winner take all pot, right? The companies that are setting these betting lines, like DraftKings, they keep a small percentage, right? So truly, your expected payoff in the long run will actually be slightly negative, right? Because they're keeping a little bit of the of the prize money as well. Um. So yeah, unless we are able to identify something that these companies can't, right, then these betting lines will always be 50-50 bets. And in the long run, I end up with kind of this, you know, zero payoff, or if they're keeping a portion of the, the money, I'll have a slightly negative payoff in the long run. You know, I, I, it's a similar idea, some of you in finance, you know, I can't make money on stocks unless I have information that somebody else doesn't, right? I need, I need to, um, those stock prices should accurately reflect, now there's tons of issues where they might not, but they should be accurately reflecting every you know, piece of data that's out there that we have um, that gives us an idea about what that, that company is worth, right? Now, if we can stumble across something that other people haven't realized 
is influencing those stock price, well, then I can start to buy and sell stock and make some money because nobody else realizes that this arbitrage opportunity exists. It's the same idea here. If I could find something that the companies setting these betting lines aren't factoring into the equation and that it matters, well, then I could make money at a betting on sports. So there, you know, it's not that nobody's going to make money. It's just that if these betting companies setting the lines truly, you know, they have access to every Thing that you do if they're you know throwing the kitchen sink in and trying to accurately predict these what the the you know betting line should be it's really gonna be really hard for an average person to like discover something that they have it's not impossible but but very difficult so what we see people do is they start to look at things that these companies are already taking in consideration and basically they overweight them or they're they're using them thinking that okay well, if the team is playing at home, well, I should always think that, that they're more likely to cover the spread or more likely. Well, no, that's already been factored into that betting line, right? But people look at that and don't think, think that way. And so we, we're going to look at and see betting behaviors. Uh, we're going to take a look at a paper that looks at people's betting habits around large point spreads and whether or not that the team is at home, right? So I kind of can see... Um, or actually, I don't remember if that's what they look at, but those are the ideas that would matter. So, oh, I don't want that to be up there. So this first table is the win percentages of teams that were more than seven point underdogs. So these teams had a very low likelihood um, of gonna you know, winning the game, right? Their win percentage is, is pretty bad. But if the betting line is set, so that it takes that into consideration, kind of notice the underdog, the win percent that they cover the betting line, I mean, these all hover right around 50%, right? So if I then go down and look at, well, what about these teams that have more than 28? If I see a 28-point you know, underdog, what's the probability that they cover that bet? Well, notice these all start to get slightly, you know, with the exception of this kind of one time period, slightly above 50%. So this would be an indicator, right? It should be right at 50%, that maybe when these large betting lines are getting set, that these companies are setting them a little bit too extreme, right? They're, you know, setting a 28 point spread. They should probably be setting something more like a 24, right? Or kind of a slightly lower point spread here because the underdog here is, is you know, basically losing by less than 28 points more than just a 50% of the time, right? Well, it's when we have really close point spreads, seven points or less, you know, this is, I mean, each one is like hovering right around 50%. So we could do something like this with, uh, you know, if you wanted to, you could go back through and look at some of these uh, spreads and just break this down by not just whether or not it was a large or a small point spread, but, well, what about people voting on the home team versus kind of the, the away team or however you wanted to break this down, right? They decided to do it by kind of large, small point spread. So it's kind of an interesting result there. So they then broke it down by, well, what if it's a, the point spread is close, seven points, I know we zoom things in here, but seven points or less, right? And now it's a home underdog. Well, once again, if we look at this, eh, we kind of hover around 50%. Looks like maybe in more recent years, um, the home underdog is covering that small point spread a little more. So maybe these companies aren't factoring in or aren't waiting that the team is at home enough. Now, if we look at kind of the large point spreads, there's some goofy stuff going on because our sample sizes start to get small. So like we get a 73% here in this, this four year time frame, but it's only based off of 19 teams. Um, but here you can kind of see there's quite a few here that are way above 50%. So that potentially, even in these large point spread games, they're not factoring in that the home team is, is gonna be able to do a little bit better um, as much as they should, right? Because these should be fit right at right around 50%. So it's kind of an interesting paper. There's some better things we could do, but they, their analysis is at least kind of hinting that potentially not all these betting lines are being set exactly 50-50 best. There's, there's things that these companies maybe aren't weighting appropriately in their, their equation for, for coming up with what that number should be in a betting line. All right, so we already did this fantasy stuff. Um, so the next kind of thing we're going to talk about with gambling is I'll introduce this idea of the hot hand fallacy, and then we'll return to see if people's gambling habits 
reflect belief in this in this hot hand. So the idea of a hot hand fallacy is that you know if I'm taking a you know sitting at the free throw line, let's just say you know not in the game, but I'm just in a, in a gym, and on on average I shoot 50% from the free throw line. I then make four in a row. Well, what's the probability that I make the fifth one? Well, each shot is independent. My underlying natural ability hasn't changed. It should be that the probability of making that fifth free throw is 50%, right? However, some people look at this and say, well, no, this is a hot player, right? They're, they're feeling like they're in the groove. So if they've made four in a row, the probability they make a fifth one is higher, right? This is the idea of the hot hand fallacy because the player's underlying ability hasn't changed. Right? Now, the reason why this might not be a fallacy when it comes to things like shooting a basketball, so usually like the idea we use here is, is flipping a coin, right? If I flip a coin, it comes up heads four times, the fifth coin flip is no more likely to be heads or tails. It's still a 50% chance. The difference with free throw shooting is, is it actually a fallacy? Because if there's some type of muscle memory or physical mechanism where you have a repeated motion, that maybe your underlying ability to make the basket is actually increasing the more shots you take. Okay? So potentially, it's not a fallacy when it comes to things like performance, right? Or the idea, but, but the idea is, if that doesn't exist, if there's no physical mechanism there, it's the same underlying ability of making the shot. Right? So a gambler's fallacy would, would kind of lead you to believe that, well, look, if they've made four in a row, and I know on average they shoot 50%, it, they have to miss at some point to balance out. The hot hand fallacy is, well, they're hot, right? They've made four in a row. They're going to make, make, be more likely to make the fifth one. So when it comes to betting, people actually, you know, usually we call this the gambler's fallacy because we tend to think people, when they're, they're gambling, we, we see evidence that they're a little more uh, likely to fall victim to, to thinking that the probability is lower as opposed to that it's higher, right? So a little bit more likely to see the gambler's fallacy play out. So you might just have a general question. If I see a long streak, like a team is just winning week after week, is it more likely that people are going to bet on that team to win the following week? Right? Well, that kind of makes sense because I have some quality measure, right? But if instead of a string of wins and betting on that team to win, well, what if we're just thinking about whether or not they cover this point spread, right? So just because a team covers a point spread four times or four weeks in a row, well, every single week, the betting line is set independently. So every week it should be a 50-50 bet, right? But people might see a team actually self, uh, or, uh, or full disclosure. So I listen to, um, if you don't, you should, it's pretty entertaining, but it's also somewhat ridiculous at times. But Pat McAfee uh, has a sports show where they go over like the betting line, especially during the NFL season. Um, and they kind of talk about this. They'll always bring up these stats. Well, this team has covered the, you know, the uh, point spread the last 15 of the 20 games. Well, it doesn't matter, right? If they played enough games, they're going to end up around 50%, right? Because every single line is set at 50%. And it's set every single week. It's not like they set them all at the beginning of the season, right? So each week as a team wins, they factor in that that team, you know, they update what they believe the quality of that team is every single week. So um, just because we look at these kind of streaks, right, if we look at these like home streaks and then road streaks of covering the point spread, the percentage that bet on the home team shouldn't change at all. It should always be 50%, right? So we can kind of set this regression equation up by looking at the actual percent of people who vote or vote, who bet on the home team, and then kind of look at Okay, if the home team has a longer win streak, well, if people think that they're just more likely than to cover the spread the following week, this would be positive. But they're kind of falling victim to that hot hand fallacy. If they look at that and say, well, man, they covered the last four weeks, this week it's got to balance out, then we would think that the longer the home streak would actually decrease the percent of people who kind of bet on the home team. So if it's negative, Right, we would kind of think of this as evidence of the gambler's fallacy. They think it's going to level out. If we see beta 3 be positive, this would be evidence that they think a kind of hot team is going to kind of continue to cover that point spread. Right? And we'd see a positive amount for, for beta 3 there. All right. So if we kind of 
and, and we're, we're also accounting, um, controlling for things like what the actual point spread is. Now they run two slightly different models. They had some different controls, I believe in, um, in model two, but pretty similar results. So if you look at, and they didn't keep it linear, they allowed, they kind of created indicator variables, right? So their indicator variable is, is the home team on a one game win streak, on a two game win streak, three, four, or five plus. So they kind of created these different potential magnitudes, um, you know, or the, the effect could vary with the number of games I've won in a row. So if we look at if the home team was on um, kind of a, a win streak here, we see that there are some significant effects. So if I kind of win one in a row, people were more likely to bet on the home team in the next game, right? Well, it should be a 50-50 bet. This should not, you know, should, should be zero, right? The next one is also, you know, two games in a row, still positive, you know, not quite statistically significant. Um, so we can't really say much here. But then if we look at like three and four games, well, there when we see teams on really long win streaks, then the effects get to be pretty large, right? There's a lot more people kind of betting on the home team, right? And this is set up as a percent. So it's like if they win three games in a row, five more percent of people end up voting on the, on the home team. Now that effect kind of goes away once we get to win streaks of, of five or longer. But you know, one, one issue here is there probably just aren't as many streaks of five games or longer here. So we're not really identifying this effect off of very many observations. So, you know, it's pretty, pretty strong evidence here. At least we're not seeing any negatives, right? We're definitely seeing that people kind of are falling victim to this hot hand fallacy when it comes to, to betting on the home team. Now, if we see kind of them on losing streaks, right? Well, this would be the idea if they believe in the hot hand, this is kind of weird, almost like believe in the cold hand. If they have a longer losing streak, I think they're more likely to lose, right? So you kind of see um, here when they're on losing streaks, people are less likely to vote on the home team to win the following game, right? And that's significant for, for one game or, or no, one loss in a row, two losses in a row, three losses in a row. Really long losing streaks. Looks like people think that the betting lines are kind of factoring that, that in more. Um, but at least for these short losing streaks, people believe that, well, the team will keep losing, right? So they less, you know, less likely that people are going to be voting on the, or voting, keep doing that, uh, betting that the home team is going to, going to cover the spread. So we find some evidence here that people are falling victim to this, this hot hand fallacy in their gambling, right? at least in their gambling behaviors. Okay. Any questions on this or? Um, so you could do, you know, I think uh, really when we look at sports e economics and kind of the work being done, a lot of it's more so on um, the behavioral side of things when we look at sports gambling to see uh, you know, what people's uh, betting behaviors are. Um, I think more, I would like to see more of this, especially, so like if we go back to the fantasy football one, I love to see more uh, something like this, where as we get more data, as more uh, states are making sports gambling legalized, right? It'd be interesting to see the number of like FanDuel users or something broken down by, by state, and then seeing if the, the teams in that state are seeing increases in attendance or, or in kind of ticket sales. Um, but no one has kind of collected that data. FanDuel has the data on, on users. So unless you can get them to give that to you, it's a little, a little bit difficult, but maybe, maybe kind of down the road, that'd be something that we could look at, right? All right. Okay. So the next kind of couple papers I want to, uh, talk through and just kind of think through. Uh, I'll try to dive a little bit more into the p-values uh, for these as we, than we did the first few, is um, something that we'll call peer effects. So we kind of already mentioned a paper um, that was related to this a long time ago. I think I mentioned uh, like kids running races against each other. When we looked at that Tiger Woods paper, this kind of measure of how do I perform depend, you know, might depend on who my opponents are, the quality of my opponents. So this might be the idea that if my opponent is a lot better than I am, I'm just less likely to care, right? I don't have any chance of winning. Or if my opponent is better, maybe that's, you know, drives me to perform better as well, and maybe my performance increases. So the quality of my peers might impact my own performance. That's the idea of the peer effect, right? So 
with this idea in mind, right, we can look at a ton of different behaviors, not just performance, but your decision to do things. So there's papers out there like uh, if you're in a friend group that has a higher percentage of people that smoke, you're more likely to start smoking. Okay? So this author had the idea of looking at Jose Canseco, kind of knowing that, you know, you're looking at stories that, you know, he introduced people to steroids in the locker room. And is there a way that we could maybe prove this with data or find evidence of this? Well, we're going to look at and see players that play with Jose Canseco, were they more likely to see kind of boosts in the number of home runs they hit um, or kind of a, a boost in, in, in the number of um, uh, in their batting average or all these different kind of performance measures. And if there was any, because just playing with Jose Canseco should have had no impact on my future performance, unless he was like teaching me, I guess, a skill, how to be a better, better, you know, hitter or pitcher, or he was giving me something that could help boost my skill or my performance, which might be steroids, right? So this is their kind of general idea. So they had a ton of data. So what, for almost 40 years of data. And basically they looked at every single player, every single player, they had these different performance measures. So sometimes they're dependent variable. Let me do something like this. So, oh, I gotta switch to the dot cam. So anytime we have kind of this peer effect paper, what we're thinking about is the performance of the individual. So they had, oh, let me move this over here. So they had as their dependent variable, they might do something like the number of home runs. Then they look at kind of batting average. Maybe they look at walks and they can run a bunch of different regressions really quick. And then what they did was say, okay, look, um, So after kind of playing with Conseco, they made this variable a one. If it was in a year, right? And they were measuring things at the year level. It was a one if it was in a year after a player had been a teammate with Jose Conseco and a zero if it wasn't, right? They then also had this measure of, I think, um, like currently, playing with Conseco, it was a one if they were, a zero if not, kind of et cetera. And they basically just run this regression for, with different dependent variables, right? And they're really gonna focus on, okay, what was the impact on the predicted number of home runs? Whoops, if this was a, it goes from a zero to a one or in years after someone played with Conseco. Conseco being this just very well-known kind of steroid user. So they had, they had one where it was currently playing with Conseco and then after, right? So, and they have a bunch of other controls, which we'll get an idea about what they were in just a second. Um, so you can kind of see here, they got the number of years of players in the league, uh, or they call that tenure, then the slugging percentage. Um, they control for the manager's even winning percentage of that player. That, you know, the manager was managing that player's team, their winning percentage. Um, they had different, like this ballpark hitting factor. So they tried to look at kind of what the average performance different ballparks were and hold that constant as well. So they had a pretty good job of controlling for things here. What they then looked at was, okay, if I single out power hitters, so they were kind of specifically looking at, uh, where is it? How did they do that? So a power position they kind of defined as catchers, first basemen, designated hitters, and outfielders, right? Those are typically positions that have slightly higher kind of home runs and kind of um, doubles or, you know, uh, kind of more power performance in baseball. So looking at those players, basically each column here is a different regression. So here is the dependent variable they used in each one of these regressions, right? So what we got, what, seven different regressions here. They then show the coefficient on currently playing with Conseco and then after playing with Conseco. Now, one thing that they do, and I, they kind of, I pulled this table for a reason. This isn't something I would necessarily expect you to do on your project, um, but you could do something like this. So individual fixed effects is basically you just create an indicator variable for every single player. And so if you're looking at an observation and it's Alex Rodriguez, it's a one. If it's not, then that Alex Rodriguez indicator is a zero. You then include another indicator for Jose Canseco, or you know, Jose Canseco, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, 
I'll just start naming players I used to like, like Ozzy Guillen, right? The one if it's Ozzy Guillen, zero if it's not. And you would have an indicator variable for every single player. We call those player fix effects and they would capture any unique differences that were specific to that player. So it's like a really good way of controlling for things. So even after controlling for that, we, so basically we would have like otherwise two identical players, but one of them is in a year after they play with Conseco, we would expect the number of home runs they hit that year to go up by about two. That doesn't seem like a lot, right? But I mean, if we think about the number of home runs, two isn't, isn't that substantially small. And it's a pretty statistically significant effect. Right? And, you know, we look at the number of strikeouts. This gets kind of interesting as well. Kind of one of the, and they go, they talk a little bit about this in the paper where, so, you know, steroid users are, are more likely to increase muscle mass, less likely to increase things like mobility and, and, and maybe uh, kind of uh, hand-eye contact. And so we kind of would expect and we actually find that they also not, yeah, they're more likely to hit more home runs, but they're also more likely to have more strikeouts as well, right? Um, they're also more likely to have RBIs. And then the only other significant effect we find is that they're more likely to get walked. And this is likely a result of kind of what their, their other output is, right? If I'm more likely to hit a home run or, or to, you know, drive in a run, I might be more likely to get walked as well. Right? So they find kind of some strong evidence that there was some positive impact of playing with Jose Canseco. Now, can they say it was specifically steroids? Probably not. But, you know, what else would it be? Maybe he had some, you know, I don't know, magic uh, you know, tips that he could, he could help these, these people who played with him uh, on their batting stance or something. But I, I think that's a little more plausible that it might have been the introduction of steroids here is why we're finding this positive effect. Okay. Now, the interesting thing is that while they were currently playing with Canseco, there wasn't really any significant impact here. So that it was something about him introducing to these, these players this drug, and then once they kind of, kind of leave and went to another team, it looks like that's really where the impact was. Um, so a little bit muddy, the results. You might not be, you know, completely believe it yet. But an interesting thing is we can actually do this for any other player as well. We could create an indicator variable for one if it was in a year after a player played with Rafael Palmero and zero if not. And if we look at all these coefficients, I mean, you can start hunting through them. I mean, there are some negative values in here, which make a little more sense because anytime you're looking at, is this a year after I play with someone, you're looking at older players. Typically, older players start to kind of deteriorate at some point. So if we look at any of these results, they're all kind of negative here. While for Conseco, they're statistically significant and positive, right? So we would kind of call these counterfactuals. We wouldn't expect these players to be sharing, um, you know, kind of steroid information as much. And, and sure enough, we kind of see that after playing with any of these other players, who some of them were known to use steroids after the fact, that their teammates weren't any more likely to kind of see an improvement in performance, or I shouldn't even say improvement, right? More home runs, but more strikeouts as well. Um, and so we kind of usually call these counterfactuals, right? So we see that there's no effect for these different players. There's a pretty significant effect for when they played with Jose Canseco. I think they also did this, uh, oh, they tried to do it with position players. So this was like uh, the second base, third base shortstop um, and found, yeah, there might be a statistically significant effect, but notice these are much kind of lower. Um, much lower than what we found for, for kind of power hitters. So, you know, kind of interesting, um, not the most, most interesting. Oh, one other thing that they did that, that was worth mentioning. They then broke their data up into two time periods, one pre-2003, one post-2003, because there was some additional kind of crackdown on steroid use in the MLB. And notice when they looked at um, non-post-2003, so only the years prior to 2003, they found even stronger positive effects here. And really after 2003 was where there was actually negative impacts. Well, this is probably because, uh, you know, now steroid use is actually punished, right? So kind of interesting result there as well uh, when we're looking at kind of this idea of peer effects. Any questions or comments there? Now, if we notice 
in these regressions, anytime we see there's three stars, two stars, or one star, this is kind of a reminder. I think I went through this before, but I can only reject and the null. And my null starts out that I think that this slope coefficient is equal to zero. So the only way I can reject that and say that, no, I found strong evidence that, in fact, the relationship between playing with Conseco and, and number of home runs is not zero. It's actually positive. The only way I can reject this is if my p-value is less than alpha. The alphas we use are 0 0.1, 0 0.05, and 0 0.01. So if my p-value is less than 0 0.1, I get a star. If it's less than 0 0.05, two stars, less than 0 0.01. I would put three stars, okay? just kind of a reminder. And then I say, you know, it's significant at the 10%, 5%, or 1% level. But, excuse me, I should have said or there. It can be significant at all levels. Right? So even if they don't show us the p-value, which is like they don't show you the p-value here, they at least indicate what levels this would be statistically significant at. Helps a little bit more when we have the p-value, which I think we had in, uh, oh no, they didn't put the p-value. It was just that they, let me see. I want to put the one table that we had. Here we go, right? They sometimes indicate those stars in a different location, but they still, still give them. Anytime there's no stars, that means it's not statistically significant. Now for your projects, you're getting the actual p-value so you'll have to like determine how many stars it would be, right? Okay, so with this idea of peer effects, um, there's actually this interesting, somewhat newer paper that came out, which is looking at swimming performance of, and I think it was middle, like middle high school uh, age kids in Taiwan. Um, but they were looking at their performance in these swim meets or this you know, race, and then how is their time impacted by the average time of every other person in their heat, right? In, in that specific race. And so the idea here is that if I'm going up against people who are better, potentially that pushes me a little bit more, right? So I should see kind of a, if the average time of my competitors goes up, that actually means that I'm going up against worse competition, right? Here it's like the longer it takes you is a bad thing, right? So if the average time goes up, if my coefficient is positive, that's telling me that, well, my time's going up as well. So when I face lower quality people, I kind of perform down to them. Now, if this was negative, well, this is gonna say, when I perform against lower quality people, I actually tend to do better. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. If we had to guess, we're probably thinking about, it's either that people perform the same all the time and that this coefficient will be zero. Doesn't matter what my competitor's times are. Or if my competitor's time goes up and they're worse, I just don't try as hard. My time would be worse as well. So my time would also go up. And they kind of control for kind of the, you know, standard deviations. So to make sure that, you know, if I'm looking at, I'm in a race with 10 other people and one of them's really good, but the other nine aren't, uh, that's kind of picking that up in the standard deviation right, as a control. Okay. So that average time is the average time of the other competitors in their heat. So if we look at the results, right, they do a couple different regression models. Really the one that we would, you know, the one that you're, you're kind of doing just as common OLS would be this column one. So we're not going to even focus on the other ones. Um, we'll just focus on column one here because that's the type of regression analysis that you would be doing in Excel for your project. So notice they looked at the average time of every other person in their heat. And what they find is the coefficient is positive. So if the average time goes up by one second, remember the interpretation of these coefficients are a one unit change in the X variable. So if it's the average time, it's in seconds. So if the average time of my competitors goes up by a second, my own performance or the individual's own performance would go up also by 0.36 seconds, right? So, and, and so, you know, three stars, so significant at the, the, the highest level. So pretty strong evidence that individual performance is impacted by the quality of the people that you're competing against, okay? Similar that, you know, we found similar things in that Tiger Woods paper. Um, and, you know, they have different controls here. So you can kind of see, you know, the, the heavier I am, my, um, you know, isn't, doesn't have an effect here. But if I'm taller, 
it actually reduces my time. So the taller I get, kind of the quicker I'm swimming. I'm sure, you know, a, a bio my kind of mechanical, you know, biomechanics person could tell you exactly why that is, but these other coefficients kind of make sense. And as someone gets older, you know, they can't swim as fast. So um, pretty strong reason to believe that these, these estimates are, uh, are legitimate. And, you know, they do some other models, which I mentioned we wouldn't kind of discuss in this class, but notice the estimates they find are really similar to just this basic kind of OLS or this simple, kind of simple multiple linear regression. Okay. So you, know, you can imagine, I could do this for a bunch of different sports. Um, looking at, you know, especially individual sports probably makes the most sense. Um, so we've now seen this in golf and now here in kind of, kind of races. I'm sure you could do this for like track and field data. Um, it's pretty interesting kind of, you know, you can really look at pure effects and then in a lot of different dimensions. All right, so I think I had one more paper that we have. So hot hand, here we go. So, yeah, we've got time. We'll go through this last paper. So I put these papers up on um, Canvas if you want to take a look more at any of them. Once again, the way I read papers, as I scroll down, is the way I should say the way I skim papers, right? So I go down until I can find a regression equation. Okay, so here's my regression equation. So what is their y variable looking at? So they're going to look at the performance of an individual. So y is kind of representing their performance. And I think this was some weird game. Um, so this was bowling, but it's like, uh, I think this is in Europe. So it's like nine, nine pin bowling or something goofy. But basically you can think about there's, there's some bowling game that these, these uh, people are playing. So your score, right, the higher the score, the better. So this Y captures their bowling score. Okay? They then control for the individual's gender, their opponent's gender. But then what they do is they create this kind of additional category to this indicator or the interaction variable, which is whether or not they're female and kind of what their opponent's gender is. So um, they kind of broke this down. I think opponent's gender is one, let's see. So it discusses blah, 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 blah. Let's go up a little bit. So playing against, okay, so the opponent's gender is only a one if you're playing against someone of the opposite gender. And then here, this is if a female is playing against someone of the opposite gender. So just opposite gender will capture like both ways, right? It could be a man, uh, male facing a female or a female going up, up against a male. Um, but then female times opponent gender will be if a female is playing against a male, right? So the additional impact of playing against someone of the uh, opposing gender, if you're a female. Okay. So we're gonna run this regression and kind of really look at, beta one would be the change in a person's score if they were female relative to male. Beta two is the change in their score if they're playing against someone of the opposite gender. Beta three is the additional impact of playing against someone of the opposite gender if you're female. All right, so we're gonna really focus on kind of beta three and beta two here. So let's go down. Uh, keep going, keep going to the results. So here's our kind of basic OLS. And this F score is like some measure of their performance. Um, and we have score and points as well. So they have three different regressions. So each column here is a regression. These columns over here, they're using some other performance of the players to control for their previous ability. So really why focus on the one that doesn't have a good control? Let's look at the one that does have it, right? So once we can control for their past ability, we look at if they play someone of, of the opposite gender, right? It looks like there's no, you know, it's a positive, coefficient, but not statistically significant. If a female plays against someone of the opposite gender, we see that their performance actually goes down, right? So if they're playing against a male, now, now notice this is just, we're bowling, right? So there's no like, there's no reason I should do any better or worse when the person next to me is, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter what age or, you know, 
but we see that there's actually kind of this negative effect. Now it's not statistically significant, but by looking at this standard error, I can tell you that this uh, p-value would be really close to the cutoff, right? So even though it's not statistically significant, pretty close to the cutoff. They then do a, you know, something that we haven't talked about in this class, but it's kind of worth, worth kind of pointing out. Um, when they run this separately based off of men and women, and they use kind of, um, it's a strategy in which you're trying to get situations that are exogenous or that just kind of happen on their own. So with that in mind, now when I look at that opposing gender variable, I'm gonna break it down to men and women. You can kind of see here, the sign is always kind of flipped, right? So if, uh, you know, women, if we look at kind of the, their ultimate score, if women are playing at someone of the opposite gender, they tend to do worse. Men tend to do a little bit better when they're going up against kind of the opposite gender. Now, this isn't statistically significant from different from zero. However, for women playing at someone of the opposite gender, it looks like it has a negative kind of impact, right? Um, so, you know, this is kind of interesting that, uh, you know, we can see that potentially, um, it's not just the quality of the person that they're going up against, right? They have opponent's ability right, controlled for. It could be something as simple as, you know, a characteristic about, about the opponent may actually alter the performance of, of the individual. And here, this is um, some evidence that maybe kind of opposite gender in this, you know, it, in this sport of this weird bowling game, excuse me, um, that, that might, that playing against someone of the opposite gender might play a role. I think they did, uh, oh, I think there's one more table in here. And I think that was it. And I think there was one more table. Oh, they had some, real, some robustness checks, but yeah. So not the strongest findings, but some finding that kind of cross, you know, cross gender sports performance may negatively impact women, right? At least in based off of, uh, off of this sport. Be a little bit more specific. Let's see, it was, um, yeah, nine, German nine pin bowling was what they were looking at. So quite the unique data set to have there. Any questions on anything there or anything related to kind of regression output or how we analyze? So hopefully just hearing more, like going through more of these is like becoming a little bit more uh, second nature to interpret some of these results when we're looking at them, thinking about the regression equations that we're looking at. Um, I want, you know, you should have one kind of written out in your project uh, that goes along with whatever, you know, regression you ran, um, unless we've kind of talked uh, independently about some different data analysis to, for, for a very small uh, select few of you that I've talked with um, about doing that. All right. So there's no more questions for me. Um, I'll probably put up a, a quiz after today's class. Um, it's probably one of the last ones. Um, that needs to be done and turned in before we meet on Thursday. I'll kind of bring in another set of uh, papers that we'll review Thursday. Um, maybe play around with some data in Excel uh, just to get a little bit more uh, idea of how we can run these regressions ourselves. And then, um, yeah, next week we'll probably do a little bit more uh, new stuff on Tuesday, but really uh, start doing some review of that practice exam that I should be getting posted. Uh, probably probably later in the afternoon tomorrow. Okay. There's no questions for me. I'll see you guys on Thursday.